I'm here in the poorly lighted old computer corner today to work on this machine. This is a Tandy 6000, the descendant of the TRS-80 Model 2. So you probably know the TRS-80 Model 1, and then the next revision of this was the Model 3, and eventually the Model 4 and the Model 4P. But there was the Model 2 also, and that was a business machine that had its own series. The 6000 is the last in the series. So I've been working on getting this going. These are pretty cool. They have full-size 8-inch floppy disks. And the computer's about halfway going so far. So the disk drive's cleaned out, the filter capacitors are replaced, and the whole thing has got a thorough de-dusting. You will notice that the keyboard is missing, and I do have a keyboard, but it's over here and has its own problems. The keyboard could use some cleanup, but it's actually in electrical working order. However, you can't actually type on it, because this is a foam and foil keyboard, and the decayed bits of foam are still in there, but they've completely eaten through the foil. Of course, these days you can go online and buy replacement foam and foil pads. Well, what if you want to create your own keyboard? After all, there's still many of these machines out there, but uh, not all of them have the keyboard. This was removable. It could get easily lost. So, on the keyboard we have a microcontroller, an EEPROM, and some supporting chips. Now, the connector for this is a 5-pin DIN connector, but this is not the same as a PC keyboard. But, as it turns out, this interface is not that complicated. Let's go to the service manual. Alright, let's start off with a look inside of the keyboard itself. So, we have our main microcontroller, crystal, keyboard matrix, you know, all the normal stuff you'd normally expect. Uh, one of these two is probably the EEPROM, uh, it might be this one, but that's not really important. This over here is the connection to the computer. So we have our 5 volts and ground, that's two of the pins. How about the other three? Well, we have a data pin that goes into the computer. We have a clock pin that goes into the computer. And a busy signal that comes from the computer. So okay, that's a start. Um, the protocol details are not in here, but uh, at least we know our inputs and outputs right here. Let's take a look at what happens inside the computer. All right, now we're on page 182 of the service manual, which is the video controller PCB, which is actually on this computer where the keyboard connects into. Connects into right here, just a word of note, this is not the same as the DIN connector on the front of the keyboard. This is the connector that's on the board, on the video controller board itself. So just keep that in mind. We have our ground and five volts as before, and then these three here, are our data from the keyboard. So we have our clock that goes in, our data that goes in, and this unlabeled one's actually the busy signal. This here is a buffer chip. All we need to know about that is that our busy signal goes out and the data and clock come in. Let's take a look at both of these first. So the clock pin goes down here and into the shift register here. And so does the data pin. It goes over to the shift register. So when our keyboard sends something, it's actually controlling this shift register here, which unserializes the data, puts it on these lines, and then when we want the computer to read it, we can just read this buffer chip here. Same as you would read any piece of data on an 8-bit system like this. How about the busy signal? That actually comes from the output of this D-type flip-flop here. Well, where else does it go? It actually goes all the way over here, up here, and into this buffer chip and you'll notice it's labeled keyboard interrupt. So this probably goes to some interrupt pin on the CPU so that we can tell the system that the keyboard has data waiting to be picked up. Now, when we actually do want to read the keyboard, we read off of this FC read line here, which controls this buffer, but it also controls this set pin here on the D-type flip-flop. So we know how to set this, we know how to read the output of it is, but how do we clear it? Again, it is hooked up to the keyboard. The data pin connects to the clock pin on the keyboard, and the latch pin connects to the data pin. What? Actually, this makes perfect sense. Let's go up a few pages and look at the timing diagram. So this here is actually what the keyboard is sending to the computer. 
It listens to the busy line, and when it's high, it knows that the keyboard can send data. The clock line looks about how you'd expect, but the data pin, eh, that's a bit weird, isn't it? Well, it has to do with that D-type flip-flop. Remember that the busy signal is set by that D-type, and it is latched on the rising edge of the data. Now, not all of these are necessarily rising. I mean, they could be like that, could be like that. But on every rising edge, you'll notice that what actually gets latched is the clock pin, which is always high. So, during this whole phase, no matter what the data does, the busy signal will stay high. It's only right here at the end, this end of data pulse, well now the clock is low. So the busy signal will now go low. And this triggers the interrupt to read the data that's in the shift register, and then the busy signal can go high again when it clears the interrupt, and then we can send in the next bit of data. So this is a pretty clever way to do it with only three pins, and again, it's all controlled by the keyboard, even the busy signal, that's controlled by this end of data pulse from the data on the keyboard, which is good. That means we can go as fast or slow as we want, and it will probably still work. So it should be easy enough to bit bang out on a microcontroller. In fact, this short snippet of code right here is all that's needed to send keyboard data into the computer. At the beginning, we just make sure that the busy pin is high, and then we send in the data, and then at the end, we send that end of data pulse to set the busy signal. That's all there is to it. So any microcontroller can do that. So this looks like a job for a generic Arduino Nano, although probably any 5-volt microcontroller will work for you. This isn't the best chip you can get nowadays, but chances are, if you have one of these, you probably have a few of these lying around. And if you don't, you can get one delivered for like five bucks. It turns out that that Arduino Nano was dead, so I'll use this Arduino Pro Mini instead. It's basically the same thing, except now you need a USB serial adapter to program it. And I'll need something to type on. This is just an old PS2 keyboard, which I stripped the end off and put a little wire header on. All you do with this is connect it directly to some of the Arduino pins. There's a power ground, a data, and an interrupt pin. PS2. Now if you don't have a PS2 keyboard you might be able to use a USB keyboard. Some of those had PS2 backwards compatibility if you just use the USB data pins as the PS2 data pins. Uh, for the record I tried a couple of my USB keyboards and none of them worked so I mean I already have this one. I also made a short breakout cable for this five pin DIN connector although you could probably get by with just stuffing some wires into the port on the front of the machine. For the record, here's what that pinout looks like. You have your 5 volts, your ground, and then the data clock and busy signals from earlier. Now, of course, you can work the PS2 protocol yourself, but it's a well-understood thing that other people have done much better than I have. So I just pulled someone's library and wrote my own mapping for which byte to send to the computer. So if I want an uppercase A, that's hex value 41. So we got caps lock A, send to 41. And there's an A right there. Now the Model 6000 keyboard sends mostly standard ASCII, so you have all of your letters and numbers, those are the same, but there are a few oddballs. So the break key sends hex 03, and that's just the break key on my keyboard. And the hold key sends the null byte, 00, which I've implemented as a system RQ button. The arrows are also you know, weird values, but I just mapped them to the arrows on mine. Now, on my keyboard, you can actually send all possible 256 combinations to the computer. So you've got your control at, control A, control B, control C for the first 32 characters. Then there's all the printable characters plus the delete key. Then if you want to send things that are above 127, you can hold down the alt key and that adds 128 to whatever other combination you press. And then as far as I know, the lock button here is not a caps lock. It just stops you from being able to type any key. But I didn't read the instructions, so I don't really know what this does. So that's pretty much all there is to it. I mean, the keyboard's hooked up and it works like you would expect. Just keep in mind that some operating systems like TRS-DOS here 
might require you to type in capital letters so you can have your caps lock turned on there. But you know what, why bother with a keyboard at all? The Arduino has a serial port, so you might as well just connect it to your computer and use your favorite serial program to send whatever you want. Bonus points if it has an option that you can set the delay between successive bytes, so that way you can just paste in whatever you want to type. Also, I figured I'd share my adapter for converting the 50-pin 8-inch drive cable to a 34-pin floppy cable, so I can use a GoTek in place of a real 8-inch drive and disk. It's not complicated. All you take is certain pins from the 50-pin side and bring them through two different pins on the 34-pin side. You can do something crazy like this, but I tried this twice and it didn't work. So since I have a router... I just decided to route out my own boards. Now this might be somewhat GoTech specific. One of the tricks with the 8 inch drive is that it wants both a drive ready and a disc change signal, which on the GoTech you can define pin 2 and 34 to either one of those signals, and that's reflected in this breakout. So I'm not sure if this will work with real floppy drives, but I'll share it anyway. Link in the description. And as for this weird connector, it's just something I happen to have on hand. It goes to the internal floppy cable on the Tandy 6000, which, by the way, the internal floppy cable is different than what you get on the floppy port at the back of the machine. Um, some of the signals that are broken out here are not broken out there and vice versa, so just be aware of that. I guess I should mention that I did get some 8-inch discs to use with this machine. Look at that. Worldwide sponsor, 1988. You're probably not going to find too many new old stock discs. All the ones that are out there seem to have stuff already written on them. They were already used, which can be interesting because there's probably, I mean, the data is probably still on here, right? So we got Never Too Rich, Power Shift, 18 Ways to Beat a Headache. The label fell off this one, but it said Goof Proof Microwave. You know, that's got to be a good one. So I'm definitely going to get my Grease Weasel out and try to read some of these before I use them. All right, well, that's all for now.